you haven't been to one of these events, who, who has not been to one of the composer's landscape events? Well, you've certainly heard you know, this is This is a very well scripted, hard worked up program uh, with some great talented students that Ms. Mont Parker coaches. Um, Ms. Mont Parker is among a very elite group of Steinway artists, um, and she has chosen to perform on Steinways in her career. And uh, we're certainly love, uh, we certainly love having her here this evening, but also being in her backyard. Um, she's a Huntington and We're very, very happy to have her here this evening. Um, I really don't have too much to say because she will certainly be doing a lot of the, the speaking on the subject of, of Schumann this evening. But one thing I always forget to say when I'm up here is to remind you, please turn off your cell phones if you have not done so already. Um, and on that note, um, I guess at this point I would really just like to welcome Ms. Mark to the stage. And again, thank you very much for coming this evening. Before I do anything else, I want to thank the Steinway Company and especially Gordon McNelly for inviting me to do this series for another season. Um, and also I want to thank you because if you weren't supportive and you hadn't come for the past season, this may not be happening tonight. Um, the fact of this being a bicentennial celebration as well as a regular concert event and coaching and lecture, um, adds another dy dynamic as far as I'm concerned. First of all, I feel very close to Schumann. And this is a really special year because in 1810, Schumann, Chopin, and Mendelssohn were born. And we did already celebrate Chopin's bicentennial earlier this year. <clears throat> we will be doing that again in the Great Neck Arts Center on November 19th. And we'll do Mendelssohn a little bit belatedly next, next season. This past summer, I asked myself a question of what, of, I felt like a child in a gumdrop factory of which Schumann would I play this evening. I had spent a good year on the great fantasy in C, of which we'll hear a movement later on this evening to play it at a New York recital. And I spent youthful years on Papillon and inside the Carnival. And I've taught almost every um, s collection of piano works. But I had only studied two or three of the movements of the Chrysleriana. And so I, was, I spent the summer having a love affair with the Chrysleriana. And I still am. It is so multi-layered and textured. It's such a wonderful piece. And I always feel like I want to play every last note that Schumann ever composed. I said to a friend that the Chrysleriana is like a study in mental illness. And she said to me, no, Carol, it's, it's, it's like a study in, of life. And she was right, but so was I. <laughs> because there's a lot of shifting from mood to mood. It's very mercurial. The music is unpredictable. And it is like life itself. But Schumann, in his states of mind, I won't say state of mind, many states of mind, in his madness even, uh, could see more clearly, could feel more deeply, and express more lucidly everything we do experience in our everyday lives. And moreover, Schumann manifested these spasmodic, spasmodic changes in everything he wrote. So anything I say about the Chrysleriana this evening is applicable to all of his music, and not just piano music, his orchestral, his chamber music. And when he was writing his great humoresque, he wrote to Clara, um, I wrote all week. I sat at the piano composing and laughing and crying all at the same time. So all of his music is about Clara and, and Robert and their tempestuous relationship and self-revelations and um, intimate reflections. I'd just like to give you a snippet of biography so that we can all think about what brought him to the state of mind that he was in when, in this period of his life. 
Schumann lost his father and his sister when he was 15. And in, a few years later, he got malaria. And he was very much in despair and not feeling well. And he began to drink, which further uh, decimated his, his health. And, and then he lost his, his brother from TB. And then um, his sister-in-law died in 1835 of malaria. And then his mother died in 1836. And all of this, of course, added to his weakened health. And then add to that Friedrich Wieck, Clara's father, who forbade them to see each other. And they were passionately in love with each other. And this really did throw Robert over the edge with symptoms of deep depression and anxiety and fear of solitude and shortness of breath and even spells of unconsciousness. And he began to fear that he was going mad. And the last straw was his failure as a pianist. He injured a finger on his right hand. And with a series of unspeakable <coughs> therapies that amounted to quackery, um, including some bizarre therapies of his own, you know, that were self-inflicted, um, he that was the end of his piano career. But the only upside of all of that is that we owe all the wellspring of piano music that we have to that fact because he threw himself whole hog into composition because he could no longer play the piano. And he picked himself up, we have to say that, by the bootstraps. He formed a group <laughs> called the Davids Bundler, which was a band, Bundler band, of progressive thinking artists and writers and musicians. And then he formed a literary journal he established, calling, called it the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik. And then he became a music journalist and a critic. And in 1838, he started writing a musical diary of his emotions, of his high hopes, of his desperate loss, his mania, his depression. He named his mania and his extroverted side Floristan and his introverted side, Eusebius, and it's in all of his piano music. You see a little F or a little E, and you, you would know it from the music, but that's his inner side or his extroverted side. And all of this musical diary was recorded in four days, and he called it the Chrysleriana. The, it opens with a rush of spontaneous feeling and emotion, and then it's followed by a very dreamy, contrasting second movement of great tenderness. And so it goes from segment to segment, wild outbursts and the deepest introspection. And if you think that there's a very serene, long movement, chances are there'll be a very playful, spirited one coming right up behind it. The, this, this amused me because the young Clara, upon hearing the Chrysleriana for the first time, she said to Robert, sometimes your music frightens me. And I wonder, is it really true that the creator of such things is going to be my husband? <laughs> but Robert instructed Clara, play my Chrysleriana often. A positively wild love resides in those movements and your life and mine and the way you look. Clearly, Clara was um, one of the main sources of inspiration, but Schumann was very deeply affected by politics and by literary works. And um, I want just to add that she was pleading with him to be more lucid in his, in his writing, because it hurt her so much when people didn't understand his writing. And he said that he would dedicate this work to her um, but he ended up dedicating it to Chopin, and maybe that's because yeah. she was not an avid performer of uh, his, this particular work. And she didn't think that it would please audiences, although her manager advised her that it was a good piece to perform. So Schumann said, so eliminate the diminuendo at the end, it means, to, and, and put in a crescendo and some loud chords and you'll get much more applause at the end. <laughs> It's very funny, but you know, it, it shows that composers are often 
less, they have less convictions about the work uh, than you might think they do, and he probably meant this, which give, uh, in turn gives us license to some extent to take a repeat or not to take a repeat. Um, the fragmentation that defines Schumann's music is memory bits uh, that coalesce and come together. You might say they're, they're gemstones that are all together set in a beautiful piece of jewelry, little, little fragments. And um, when I mentioned before the literary uh, inspirations for Schumann, in particular the works of E.T.A. Hoffman, who was a contemporary of his, who wrote a book called Christ Liriana and another book with a very long title, The Life and Opinions of Kater Mürr, who was a cat, with the fragmentary biography of Kapellmeister Johannes Chrysler on random pieces of scrap paper. <laughs> it's about an eccentric musician named Chrysler with whom Schumann very much identified. And I believe that's the only fact that we need to know about that book except for the fact that it's written in a stream of consciousness style like Proust. And of course this music is, is just that way too. So all we need to do is find the bits and pieces to relate to our own lives in order to fully um, appreciate it. I think that's what art does or should do, to activate and make us draw from our own life experience. Schumann believed, and I think that this is really critical to understanding his music, many the 19th century artists and poets and writers, that life was a series of fragments that were mysteriously related and could only be united and transfigured by the poet or the musician. I think that's the key to his music. Later collections like the Fantasiestücke and the Kindersennen, you can lift a work out very easily and have it serve as a beautiful encore and play it alone and it, it will be beautiful. But the Chrysleriana is so linked, it's one piece morphing into the other. And sometimes there doesn't seem to be a way to link it. Sometimes there's a tone that you, you can link to the next piece. Or a pregnant pause, timing is very, very important. But sometimes there's no answer, a total non sequitur. And we just have to play it and trust blindly without a clear answer, but life is like that, and, and this music really mirrors life. I think, and never anywhere as much as in Schumann's music do we have to flex our imaginations and come up with colors, and um, technique is a big factor, but probably having a courageous and impetuous and spontaneous nature helps a lot, and, and maybe maybe throwing ourselves into it as though we too were a little bit mad, at least complex. A word about the form, there are eight movements. You won't be able to tell if you don't know the work where, where one movement starts because there are episodes within each movement. But each movement is in an ABA form, which means there's a middle interlude, which he called intermezzo. And it comes back around each piece to, to the same theme as it began. And, and but there's no relationship between the beginning of the piece and the end of the piece. It's just ongoing, th through composed, just like life. Most of these early works were written when, before Schumann was 29, and he revised them about 12 years later because he didn't agree with some of his earlier frivolities. But many pianists prefer the earlier versions for many reasons that are too technical to go into, but I was grateful for some of his changes because it was editing out some of the what I thought were redundancies, and it is a long work. It takes a half hour. So there are many, many strangenesses in Schumann. There are strange, beautiful harmonies. There's, as I said, extreme introversion. Sometimes he writes on a third clef. Sometimes there are notes only to be imagined, and you put them down silently without them sounding like in the Sphinx movement in the Carnival. Sometimes there's a chord in the Papillon where you release one note at a time and you're left with only one note, like the smile of the Cheshire cat, you know, where every parts of the cat disappear and you're just left with the smile. 
He doesn't mean to be funny, Schumann. It's really d more like bringing us to the, risk, to the brink of absurdity. He takes risks and experiments a lot. And he writes pedal, pedal, pedal all over the place, but you need all three pedals in his music. And it's not clear except if you're a pianist and you figure out which one is necessary, which, which pedal he means, because he just puts pedal. And he writes retard, retard, retard here and there and there and there. And if you did every single retardando that he said, it would be very unnatural. I think what's implied is a rubato, and with taste and discretion and experience, you end up making those retardandos where he, he wants them, really. But the stop-start nature of a lot of his writing with retards. Um, I had this conversation with a lot of concert pianists whom I respect, and that's the consensus. Um, and as I said, tempo choice is very uh, critical in this music. I'm going to skip because I know I'm talking a lot, but I just feel like I want to tell you all that I'd like you to know. Oh, Clara had trouble performing the Papillon, one of his earliest works, for an audience. She complained to Schumann that the audience was confused and fidgety, but we're so much more sophisticated and well-educated now, so we, we won't be like that, right? <laughs> Of course, this is going to be up to me. <laughs> so to perform Schumann, we have to read the music. We have his landscape, to use my favorite metaphor, the score, is very jagged, like a thorny thicket of notes, a rocky terrain. It's, to be frank, it's very off-putting at first glance. Um, dotted figures and hands crossing and um, lots of German indications. Schumann took that from Beethoven, in late Beethoven, he began to write in German rather than the traditional Italian. And, you know, Beethoven was Schumann's master, and then Schumann was Brahms's master, and so it went through musical history, one genius nourishing the next one in line. It's so beautiful to, to study it that way. So please join me on this journey of Schumann's diary and our own lives and try to define if I am successful in communicating all these various moods, the emotional states according to your own life experience. There's even a little tribute to Bach um, buried in one of the movements. As I said, it takes a half an hour, but it's probably the most interesting and varied of all music. And the last piece, you won't, the, you, you won't even know it's the end, because I'm not putting in big chords. Um, the last piece descends into the depths of the piano and scampers away into distant silence.
approaching session, um, partly because our technicians are going to change reels or something. Okay. <laughs> so if there are any questions that anybody would like to ask about music before we do the class part, I'd be happy to. Is this going to be recorded? <laughs> yes, we will record it. And when will the disc It's not be being recorded um, for professional use. A couple of little things happen. <laughs> I'm not going to release it. It was not bad. But <laughs> so anyway, my husband's really mad at me, I'm sure. <laughs> One doesn't do that. But there are more pianists here than lay people. The place is just filled with guys. There's no scarier audience than that. <laughs> I'm going to play two of the pieces that Schumann was very interested in the mind of a child. Um, perhaps ever since Clara, who was pretty much a child when he met her, she was about 15 or maybe younger, she called him a moonstruck maker of charades. The Kinder Sandin is, is an adult's recollection of childhood. And the pieces are quite demanding, and many concert pianists choose to play that in, in performances. But the album for the young, Opus 68, um, containing 48 pieces, were deliberately written by Schumann because he wanted young players to have the possibility of having extremely pleasing aesthetic experiences because piano education at that time was mostly focused on etudes and exercises. And it was mainly for his own daughter, Maria, his youngest daughter, Seven, that he composed it. Um, and he wanted them to be able to use their imaginations. And um, by the way, Schumann was the first of the composers to put poetic titles on his music. Before that, it was mostly, you know, titles according to the form, a sonata or a waltz or a mazurka. And so these are little character pieces. And we're going to start the um, class part. Um, I wonder if we should put the other. Um, Esther, do you think this is going to be all right to support the music? Oh, yeah. OK. Okay. We'll start with Rebecca Nelson, who is a student of Esther Marx, and she will play two selections from Album for the Young.
she, she's clearly very musical and she has a wonderful teacher because she had all the phrasing and all the nuance the right way. And um, this piece, which is called in certain anthologies, First Loss, is also sometimes called First Sorrow. And it's very interesting. Do you, do you think of something sad? Have you thought of what that first sadness or first loss might have been? For Schumann, what what are some of your ideas? Tell everybody. What what do you think it could have been that, that made him so sad when he wrote that piece? He may have lost something, yes, or somebody that was dear to him. And he puts in this is a wonderful study in phrasing, and you see these little To, to hasten and then to hold back. She's doing that very intuitively. It's also the first, one of the early studies with the use of the pedal. That's what that contrivance is, so that she could reach the pedal. And also the fact that each hand in this piece gets a chance to have the melodic line, which she also handled very, very beautifully. And the happy farmer, where, where is that in this one? Do you know the green one? That also gives each hand, especially it starts with the left hand melody, which probably in any music that Rebecca had before then, there wasn't that much opportunity, but she really differentiated between Just do the first up, up to here and, and, and make and have everybody here what a nice difference you're making between the melody in the left hand and the very soft accompaniment in the right hand. Which means soaring. So 
soaring as an eagle would soar. And it's a wonderful piece. It's used very often for encores or in a group of selections. It's not always played within the whole of the fantasy pieces. So please welcome Mark Fisher. <laughs>
Um,
nicely. I would do it even more.
pianissimo, and you're not playing pianissimo there, so you...